Let us stand and pray for God's blessing. We're going to pray first for protection and then for the outpouring of the Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God of heaven, God of earth, God of angels, God of archangels, God of patriarchs and prophets, God of apostles, God of martyrs, God of priests, God of virgins, God of all the saints. O oh God, you have power to give life after death and rest after toil. There is no other God but you, creator of all things, seen and unseen. O oh God, you desire that all mankind, all humanity, be saved. And so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son to bring to naught the works of the devil. We humbly entreat you, deliver us from all the power, the snares, the deceits, and wickedness of all the spirits of hell, and to keep us in safety, Lord. We beseech you, Lord, send forth the Spirit of truth, whom your Son promised to his disciples, as once you cast down the devil like lightning from the heavens, so now send forth the paraclete from above to drive far away the accuser and oppressor of humanity and protect us against all that would harm us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Come, true light. Come, awakening of souls who are asleep. Come, resurrection of the dead. Come, spirit of truth that sets us free. Come, life-giving word that created the universe. Come, creator spirit, our comforter and champion. Come, revelation of divine love. Come, author of miracles. Come, divine mercy, source and summit of all wonders. Come, abundance of merciful love, lavished upon your prodigal sons and daughters. Come, Lord Jesus, with the Shekinah glory of your spirit, to fill us all with your anointing and empower us with the flame of your love. We ask this through Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns forever and ever. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Please be seated. I want to begin with a passage of Elijah when he had a showdown with the false prophets on Mount Carmel. Ahab has this confrontation with Elijah, and Ahab is the king of Israel at that time. So he was considered like having an anointed position over the people of God to govern them and to lead them, but he wasn't doing his job. It was, his heart was seduced by the things of the world. So when Elijah, when he sees Elijah, he confronts him. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have forsaken the commandments of the law and followed the Baals. In other words, he's, selling, he's accusing Elijah of being a disturber of the peace, of rocking the boat. And Elijah's saying, uh-uh, I'm not a disturber of the peace. You are, because you're a promoter of false peace. You're worshiping idols. You're inviting idolatry to contaminate our culture and, our, and, our, and the kingdom of God in our midst, our relationship with the Lord. Then Elijah calls him to a match. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel. And the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the sons of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people, and he said to them, How long are you going to, how long will you go limping with two different opinions? And other, other translations say, How long are you going to straddle the issue? How long are you going to have one foot in both camps? Then he says, if the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am the left, 
a prophet of the Lord. The Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now, let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in places, cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull, lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord God. And the God who answers by fire, that's the real deal. That's the true God. And all the people answered, all right, let's do it. Let's do this. Then Elijah said to the prophets, Abel, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, and put no fire to it. And they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, crying out, O Baal, answer us. There was no voice, no one answered. And they limped around the altar which they had made, and at noon, at noon Elijah was like, Ain't nothing going to happen. And he says, he starts to mock him. Let's see, where was I? I'm saying, cry aloud, he's a god. Maybe he's musing, or he has gone aside, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. Keep going. He's like taunting them, right? And they cried aloud and cut themselves with their custom, as there was after their custom with swords and lances, until the blood gushed out. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one heeded. Then Elijah said to all the people, All right then, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. And he said, all right, now, fill four jars with water, and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. It's kind of hard to ignite something that's drenched and soaking wet, right? So he says, I want, I want to make this seem as impossible as imaginable. Drench this with water. I mean, it's, it'll be impossible for even a human being to come and try to ignite it and light it up, let alone miraculously fire coming down from heaven. And he says, do it a second time. He did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. Do it a third time. He must have been thinking, all right, Lord, you better come through, or if not, this is going to be really bad. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, you alone, Elohim Adonai, that you have turned their hearts back from the humility of his prayer. This is uh, the law of attraction. From his humility, it attracted God's love to act. And from there, the fire came down from heaven the fire fell, consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and even the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They, were, they prostrated, and they said, the Lord is God. The Lord is God. Now you might think, well, that's pretty cool, but it's probably made up. I mean, were you there? Did you see it? How do you know it's true? Well, something similar happened in Fatima in 1917, on October 13th. And our blessed mother, 
was asked if the people they were they people asked Jacinta Francisco and, and Lucia ask our Blessed Mother for a miracle to be the sign to confirm that these apparitions are coming from God that they're not your imagination it's not mass hysteria it's not being made up it's not fairy tale or myth like this is real this is God is is speaking to us give us a sign to confirm the credibility of what you're saying and Mary our Blessed Mother said okay I will on the last day October so many people every month from May until October the crowds just got bigger and bigger and bigger until October 13th showed up and it was drenching rain soaking everything was muddy and there was over 70,000 people recorded there and many of them were not believers they were Freemasons they were skeptics they were anti-clerical um, what should we call it anti-clerical um, agents of the government that came to make a mockery of this as being religious fanaticism as being medieval superstition and they wanted to make a total joke out of it and then we know about the miracle of the sun and after that miracle of the sun what happened it was like fire coming down from heaven as we saw in Mount Carmel and as a result after everybody saw this and no scientist has been able to explain it it was recorded in the secular um, anti-clerical newspapers of Portugal it was even recorded in a newspaper in New York no scientist could explain it away after the miracle be finished and the and the sun was no longer seemingly dancing in the sky everything was immediately dry like that but the most important miracle is what happened in their hearts because many of them were cut to the heart like they were at Pentecost and they experienced the presence of God in their midst and they had a sense almost like what seemed like an illumination of conscience because they began to repent of their sins they thought the end was near literally as the sun looked like it was about to crash upon the earth they thought it was the end of the world and they began to immediately repent from their sin and implore God's mercy and in essence cry out the Lord is God the Lord is God what just happened in our day and age we witness a culture clash of epic proportions nothing less than a cultural revolution is going on this unprecedented revolution will have implications which will inevitably inevitably impact society on the geopolitical level but even more importantly on the local level in terms of how it effect, affects and impacts faith and family one of the most valiant intellectual warriors of our time right now is a man by the name of Jordan Peterson yes sir right amazing and this man he says we're entering an era of exponential trans experiential transformation we are in a time of unparalleled possibility for good and for evil we're at a crossroads so in talking about this conference awake or woke the first part is about the culture war and the second part is about care for our souls in the midst of it the first part I want to talk about is what is going on it seems like the world's gone crazy what is going on how do we get here and where are we going and my purpose in speaking about that is trying to understand the history premises and tactics of woke ideology now I want to look at the historical and philosophical framework of wokeism through the lens of discernment of spirits and the signs of the times I won't go in depth into critical race theory nor LGBTQ related issues such as transgenderism and the mainstream rise of drag queens part two is going to be about care of our souls how do we build an ark to save us from getting washed up how do we overcome this this talk is not meant to stir paranoia but metanoia 
Nor is it meant to be tribalistic, which is to stir greater division between the left and the right through an us versus them heated rhetoric. I hope to shed some light and not just generate heat and smoke. Moreover, by the grace of God, I hope to stir in your hearts the zealous fire of the Spirit's flame of love who leads us forward with confidence in the final victory. Another great intellectual warrior who's now since gone to the Lord is B-16, Pope Benedict XVI. He says, we're living in a time of great dangers and of great possibilities. A time of enormous possibilities, or right, a time of great dangers and of great opportunities, a time of enormous possibilities and enormous menaces, both for man and for the world. A period that also imposes a great responsibility on us all. Another great thinker and speaker and writer is Peter Kreeft. And he says, he wrote, he did, he wrote this in 1988 on a book, so much of his writing is fantastic. This book is called Fundamentals of the Faith. Not that we're meant to be fundamentalists, but there's certain foundations that we got to get right in order for us to not be deceived by half-truths. He says, the signs of the times seem to nearly all thoughtful observers, anyone who's really paying attention, seems to be pointing to a fundamental turning point. The end of an age, perhaps of all ages. Remember the prophet Elijah, what he said? How long will you straddle the issue? This is very similar to what Moses before him said. I place before you two paths, life and death. Choose life. When I was growing up, there was this group called Black Sheep. I grew up in hip-hop culture. There was a group called Black Sheep. They would say, you can get with this, or you can get with that. You can get with this, or you can get with that. I suggest you get with this, because that is kind of whack. <laughs> We're confronted with a culture war between good and evil, light and darkness, Truth and lies. The essential key, though, is to learn how to properly discern between the two. And this is all the more challenging in a cultural milieu of dominating influences that indoctrinates its own agenda through the education system, as well as the most prominent social media platforms. Because the whole sense of truth is inverted. It's twisted, it's inside out, it's upside down. As the, book of, as the prophet um, Isaiah says, woe to us when we start to call good evil and evil good. Lies truth and truth lies. If we truly love in this war, there's going to come a point where we got to choose a side. There's got to come a point where we've got to make a decision. There's going to come a point where it can't be both and. It's going to have to be either or at some stage. There's no straddling the issue. A choice needs to be made. Another great prophet for our times is Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. And he had a lot of prophetic things to say about our era. He says, quote, The refusal to take sides on great moral issues is itself a decision. It is silent acquiescence to evil. The tragedy of our time is that those who believe in honesty, those who believe in honesty, lack fire and conviction. While those who believe in dishonesty are full of passionate conviction. You've heard that quote, the only thing needed for the triumph of evil is that the good do nothing. There's no room for straddling the issue, for sitting on, for fence sitting, the, fen the sitting on the fence of indifference or lukewarmness. So what is the central issue of this cultural collision? The central issue of our age, which is critical to save Western civilization from cultural collapse, 
It's as simple as this question, which seems like a no-brainer. It's this question. What is real? You might wonder, what? Really? It comes down to that. What is real? Let's unpack that. This is, there is a fundamental revolt in our culture against any objective sense of reality altogether. Not even biology is objective anymore. If I feel like being a cat, and I, and I in my whole mentality, like, I love my cat so much. I've never experienced love in my life than for my cat. I'm never more at home in my element than when I'm with my cat. And so I start to identify so much with my cat that I identify myself with that cat nature. And I want other people to respect that. This sounds like it's Looney Tunes, right? Super crazy. This is going on. I didn't make it up. What is real? Another way of posing this question of what is real. Remember that show? Who's the boss? Remember that show? Me and my mom used to love that show. And Alyssa Milano, I used to be in love with Alyssa Milano. Now Alyssa Milano's gone crazy. Who's the boss? Who's in charge? Who has dominion over life? Who defines reality? We? Ourselves? Or God? It's that simple. This speaks to me so deeply because I was sucked into this culture. Before I got the name and the new label, Woke, I had the spirit of everything it represents. And today, by God's divine mercy, is the 25th anniversary, April 19th, 1998, 25 years ago, God gave me a great grace on Divine Mercy Sunday, which was an illumination of conscience. Have you ever heard of an illumination of conscience? I didn't, until it happened. Have you ever heard of Divine Mercy Sunday? I didn't, until it all came together. Illumination of conscience, well, Divine Mercy Sunday, which we just had this past Sunday, the Lord Jesus says to St. Faustina, I desire that the Feast of Mercy be a refuge and shelter for all souls, and especially for poor sinners. On that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I will pour out a whole ocean of graces on that day. All the divine floodgates through which graces flow are open to offer sinners complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. Before I come as the just judge, I come as the king of mercy, and humanity will not have peace until it turns to the fount of my mercy. Now, what's an illumination of conscience? Have you ever seen that book, The Warning? It's pretty popular now in Catholic circles. There's an amazing prophecy there by Pope Paul VI. But just to describe in miniature, in summary, what the illumination of conscience is, our Blessed Mother told Father Gobi, you heard of Father Gobi, the Marian movement of priests? Our Blessed Mother told him about a judgment in miniature. Each one will see his own life and all he has done in the very light of God. And God the Father, many years ago, before Matthew Kelly became famous today as Matthew Kelly, God the Father, Matthew Kelly, dynamic Catholic, just rediscovering Catholicism, all that, he experienced, before he was famously known as he is now, he experienced this locution from God the Father, and one of the things that was said was this. You will see your own personal darkness contrasted against the pure light of my love. I experienced that, and it rocked my world. It left an indelible mark in my life. And it was, when, it was that that woke me up, that really woke me up to the reality of spiritual warfare. Because nine months before this, I had a conversion experience such that I began to love Jesus. But I had been so immersed in the world before that, that I hadn't had any sense of discernment of spirits or the reality of evil in the world. So I was still very, very, um, quote, open-minded and very, very, I didn't have any conviction, any of the convictions that I have today in, in many areas. Because that took time before it came out. But during that illumination of conscience is when I realized the reality of what I'm sharing today in this teaching. 
and what was underpinning uh, what led me astray. Our Lord Jesus, in a thundering voice, said to another mystic by the name of Elizabeth Kendallman in the early 60s, just before the chaos that followed the Second Vatican Council, just before the sexual revolution in the U.S. in 1968, which is a watershed moment in terms of cultural revolution in America. Jesus says, before the difficult times are upon you, prepare yourselves for the vocation I have called you to by renewed tenacity and a firm decision. Some people might be thinking, well, what's my vocation? Um, not simply your vocation, whether to be married or single, but your vocation to be a child of God and a follower of Jesus Christ, number one. That's our vocation. Our vocation to be a worshiper of God. That's our primary vocation to focus on. And then our Lord continues, before, again, as he said, before the difficult times are upon you, prepare yourselves. You must not be lazy, uninterested, and indifferent, because the great storm is brewing just ahead. Its gusts will carry away indifferent souls consumed by laziness. Elijah, remember? How long are you going to straddle the issue? He's calling us to get on board this fiery chariot of God's flame of love. So let's break down this culture war in these two camps. There are two, dis by the way, in terms of that question, what is real? The primary cultural, the crux of this cultural collision, to point it, to boil it down to that question, what is real? That might seem kind of strange, but for me it really resonates from my own experience and from, this, from studying what's going on. From my own experience, because I was, my primary passion become, before coming to know the Lord's divine love was my own art as an artist, the works of my own hands as an artist, my own passion for life, me, myself, and I artistically expressed. And in my art, in my, and by the way, it was interesting, God's, God's wise, wise design, that revelation, that illumination of conscience happened while I was, while the Lord told me to go look at my sketchbook. It was interesting because to put it very brief, my sketchbook was like my diary, the story of my soul, everything was put into my art. And I had just came back from Mass on that Divine Mercy Sunday, didn't know, didn't hear about Divine Mercy that day, but I was filled with God's grace and presence. And as I was changing in, in my room, I felt the Lord knocking on the door of my heart, and He said, without audible words, but I knew He was Him asking, look at your sketchbook. And I put it off, because I was hungry. I, hadn't, I had been fasting. It was already 12 o'clock. I wanted to get my grub on. And the, then the second time I hear the Lord, look at your sketchbook. Put it off again. I was like, Lord, I'm done praying today. You know, it's been a long morning already. I want to eat. And I put it off. And then the third time, the Lord knocked on the door of my heart with authority. And he wasn't asking me anymore. He commanded me. He says, look at your sketchbook. I was like, ooh, okay. Sorry. As soon as I opened that sketchbook, it was like the veils that keep us blind and unaware of the spiritual world that surrounds and influences, all of those were removed. And through my own artwork, I saw the state of my soul in its darkness in contrast with the light of God. And in the midst of that illumination was a sense, a deep sense, of the spiritual war for souls going on in the world and how I had been bought into it. And I bring that up again because I'm reminded that one of my primary stickers that I had on my art book, on my, in my portfolio, was the sticker that I probably got from Berkeley that said, question reality. So if you've, you've probably you've seen, or heard, seen the bumper sticker, which has the expression question authority, well, we're questioning authority, the, the, the distrust of authority, now has gone to the point of distrust and the questioning even of reality. 
where there's no bearings of any sense of objective truth at all. So let's, let's get down to some of these premises without being too philosophical. There are two distinctly different worldviews colliding with explosive force. And the two distinctly different worldviews are these. One, all moral decisions having eternal consequences either orient us to God, the goal of life, or away from Him. We work out our faith through our choices, especially in the moral arena. The arena of moral choices is where we are each and all directly involved in the work of our salvation. So that's one camp. The second, secular culture does not recognize anything as for certain and has as its highest goal one's own ego and one's own desires as the final measure. Just live for yourself. The enemy who's the first rebel against authority, against all that is real in God's creation and plan of redemption, which is that, that rebellion of, the, of, of Lucifer, may he be bound, that, that remember, he was the, he was, his name is called Lucifer. Why? Because he was the most illumined. He was the one most filled with the light of intellect. And I've even heard a tradition, I don't know what its source is, I even heard the tradition that in the heavenly realm, he was also the one entrusted with uh, musicology, like uh, being able to have a, court, a, a power and influence uh, um, with music, because God distributes his attributes and powers to all of the different angels according to hierarchical order. So he was the most intelligent in terms of intellect, and he has some kind of connection with music. But Lucifer, blinded by his own light, chose darkness, which is, I will not serve. And that expression, I will not serve, was the expression of his pride and his rebellion, from which war originally broke out in heaven, as we hear about in the scriptures. That same idea, I will not serve, is the, um, the philosophy of a, a sinister person by the name of Anister, Alistair Crowley. And Alistair Crowley, he's like one of the masterminds before, of what we know today as Satanism. He's one of the masterminds of that. And so that expression, uh, we will not serve or serve your own will, I can't remember how they word it, but it's become popular even in Hollywood and in pop culture. Do what thou wilt. Do what thou wilt. Do what thou wilt. That's exactly it. Thank you, bro. Do what thou wilt. And you know who's rocking that quote on his, on his jacket? Jay-Z. You think he was ignorant of it? You don't think he knows where it comes from? He knows fully well where it comes from. He knows fully well where it comes from. And so this, is, this stuff is like all over the place. The, the, this wokeism, I want to call it the new quote-unquote enlightenment. The new enlightenment. Wokeism is an ideology, a set of ideas representing an elite sense of an intellectual illuminism. We've seen that throughout history with Gnosticism and different things. What does it mean, though, to be woke? At its best, wokeism or wokeology expresses social concern for justice against discrimination and systemic oppression, such as racism and sexism. On that level, we stand in agreement in the fight against such things. However, the desire for social justice has also been the apparent goals of other political philosophies, but which end up going in a direction where we clearly cannot stand in solidarity with. For example, the French Revolution, which began in 1789, this French Revolution came out of the false progressivism of what's called the Enlightenment. And it had as their glorious goals the ideals of democracy, republic, liberty, and yet use these to, dis to justify disregarding the basic civil rights of their enemies and the dechristianization of the nation. 
Not to mention a lot of shedding of blood. What about communism? Communism's propaganda has a similar sales pitch. On the surface is a cry for social justice, but one which ends up amounting to a, to a totalitarian nightmare and the collapse of culture. History shows any number of Hitlers and Stalins whose theories, aided by skillful propaganda, brought disaster to millions. And when Our Lady of Fatima performed that miracle on October 13th, 1917, within two weeks, the Bolshevik Revolution happened in Moscow, USSR. And that, from that revolution came a, widespread, a, a wildfire of hatred and that ideology that was adopted by governments throughout South America, throughout the world, and it's knocking at our door right here in the United States. It is knocking at the door, whether it's in or not. I just saw on YouTube something speaking about, I don't even know who this person was, but it was a woman talking about taking efforts to prevent people from exercising their fundamental rights. The U.S. is taking efforts to prevent people from exercising their fundamental rights. So that there's this language of, of so much of what has the fingerprints and the smell of communism already at work behind the scenes. So wokeism is, and, and you know, you've heard it said, St. John Paul II used to speak, used to mention this, that more Christian blood was shed last century because of communism and other atheistic type regimes than all of Christianity combined. In one century. So our Blessed Mother was preparing us for this in calling us to pray, to repentance, to live a life of the Gospels and the commandments of the Lord. So wokeism is a narrative, which means a story or an account that is being force-fed to society through mainstream social media ruled predominantly by the political left. This philosophy has introduced a, no, a new vocabulary into the cultural psyche. Words such as white privilege, intersectionality, positionality, etc. Wokeology has drastically altered the meaning and usage of simple words like love, hate, Man? Woman? Marriage? Can't get more basic than that. And not only are such concepts suddenly everywhere, but conformity to their proper use is increasingly demanded. The irony of their so-called claim of tolerance, diversity, inclusivity, equality, is that it totally does not apply to any it totally does not apply to anyone who doesn't bow down or fly the flag of what represents their voices and views. If you're on a team and now all of a sudden you show up and all the people in charge say, now you got, today we're not gonna wear a normal jersey, we're gonna wear our new rainbow jersey. And if you don't wear it, you're off the team. Or taking your kids to go watch you know, an innocent Lakers game. And all of a sudden, the halftime show, because it's June, Pride Month, a bunch of drag queens come out and perform this disgusting dance in front of your kids. And you're not supposed to complain and get upset, and if you do, you're considered a religious bigot? How is that inclusivity and tolerance? Those who do not validate, celebrate, and applaud their sense of civil rights are at risk of being canceled, are forced to conform through intimidation of societal shaming. Moreover, can be excluded from basic rights and eventually incarcerated or even executed. That's usually the trajectory of how it goes. It doesn't happen overnight. The irony of their accusations against what they label and scapegoat as being a system of oppression such as patriarchal narrowness of straight white men, 
is that their mindset and agenda will only lead to its own kind of oppressive dictatorship, a totalitarianism, as can be seen wherever communism has gained power in government. And so much of, of wokeism, it comes from Karl Marx, one of the intellectual fathers, so to speak, of communism. Its revolutionary spirit seems to be a kind of political anarchy. Down with institutions, down with the police, down with government, soft on crime policies, pushing to keep cr criminals out of jail. Because see, there's an ideological belief among the left that the criminal justice system is steeped in white supremacy. And for that reason, anyone who is convicted as a criminal is actually a victim of the system and needs to come out in the name of justice. And yet, doing that is only hurting the people they say they're out to help, which is the poor. Because once these people come out of jail, where are they going? They're going to poor communities. And they're perpetuating the same crimes. Uh, anybody see that um, BLM documentary by um, Candace Owens? Right? So what does it mean to be asleep to world culture? It means being ignorant, deaf, and blind to what is happening in the world, the history of systemic oppression. What does it mean to be asleep to Christ? Spiritual death? Dead to what matters to God? Faith in righteousness? The salvation of our immortal souls? If we give but little importance to matters of faith, truth, and grace, then we can expect to receive little, if anything. The book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 14, says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. There's an ancient homily in the early centuries of Christianity, before the third on Holy Saturday, in which this anonymous author poetically de depicts Christ as the Good Shepherd going down into Sheol, into the darkness of the netherworld in search of Adam and Eve as for a lost sheep. And Jesus, who is both God and the son of Eve, journeys down into the abyss of Sheol's shadows of death to free them from the sorrow of their captivity. He approaches bearing the cross the weapon won, that won him his victory, and at the sight of Adam, Christ took him by the hand and raised him up and said, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I am your God, who for your sake have become your son. Out of love for you and for your descendants, I now, by my own authority, Command all who are held in bondage to come forth. All who are in darkness, be enlightened. All who are sleeping, arise. I order you, O sleeper, wake up. I did not create you to be a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. Rise up, work of my hands. You who were created in my image, rise. Let us leave this place, for you are in me and I am in you. Together we form only one person, and we cannot be separated. What does it mean to be awake to Christ? To be awake to Christ and not spiritually asleep is to be aware of the spiritual war going on in the world behind the scenes that works through the corruption of our culture. It's to have eyes to see, ears to hear, the gift to discern the signs of the times and the spirits behind movements, to identify the spirit of darkness at work in our world in light of God's prophetic word. As St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, before he talks about spiritual warfare in chapter 6 he says in chapter 4 acquire a fresh spiritual way of thinking put on the new self created in God's image 
whose justice and holiness are born of truth. This is metanoia, to receive our identity from God's love. To be awake is to know who is the true light of the world, to know the grace and truth of Christ's victorious cross and resurrection, not as fiction, but historical fact. And the greatest, revolu and the greatest revolutionary act this world has ever known or will ever know. As Archbishop Sheen said, this is the choice before us, either to revolutionize the world and break under it, or revolutionize ourselves and remake the world. That's the revolution, metanoia, conversion, receiving a new heart from God's heart a new spirit from God's self because we're made in no other image than his likeness. To be awake is to recognize as Sheen did when he said, unless souls are saved, nothing is saved. There can be no world peace unless there is soul peace. What use is it to gain the whole world and to lose our souls? And Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. My peace I give you in a way that the world can never offer. We're going to break. We're going to take a break of 10 minutes for a stretch. There'll be question and answers in the hall if anybody has anything that they want to talk about or ask. And then we'll come back for the, the second part of the conference on care of the soul. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let me summarize some of the points in regards to these two sides. Though the cultural conflict is encountered predominantly in the arena of moral conscience with opposing philosophies forming each of them, Essentially, the two main contenders of the invisible spiritual war are Christ and Satan. There is only one ultimate victor over the power of darkness. Only one who could, free the, who could free humanity from the works of evil. Only one who can endow a person made for immortality with the eternal life and glory. The ultimate choice between life and death before humanity collectively and personally boils down to this option. God or nothing, todo or nada. Unless souls are saved, nothing is saved. Pope John Paul II, he visited the United States before becoming elected the Holy Father, the successor of St. Peter in October of 1978. Before that event, when he came to the U.S., he said, quote, we're now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. The final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. So much of this conflict boiling down to what is truth, what is real. If a human person sets his or herself up as the sole lord of one's existence, then this leads to illusion, elitism, and eventually the most grotesque forms of idolatry imaginable, as, as was seen in the Grammys a few months ago. Or in 2016, when they inaugurated that new tunnel in Switzerland, which is the longest underground tunnel in the world, the ceremony that they did there as I saw and only knew because of watching a video by Father Ripperger, the ceremony was just dis utterly despicable and not worth mentioning. This seductive idolatry begins as the idol of a sovereign self. The sovereign self means the individual is self-sufficient, defines truth, and determines what is reality. And this attitude called solipsism, philosophically, dominates most of modern philosophy, began with Descartes, and suggests that the only sure reality is our own thoughts. 
This leads to the postmodernism of today, which solemnly and sadly claims that we cannot have certainty about anything, leading most people who buy into it into an exist existential crisis. So the sovereign self, it reflects the secular belief that the individual human being has absolute autonomy over any moral authority outside of one's own thoughts. The power and right to place greater importance on one's own freedom and ability to choose over and above anything else, especially the truth of God or any objective sense of human nature. This form of idolatry in our post-Christian era, as it's called, enshrines individual freedom as unlimited in its ability to decide what is good and what is evil. This relativism, the assumption that there is no truth, is a self-contradiction. It's incoherent. For to say that there is no truth is to assert that it is true that there is no truth. But there is even one thing but if there is even one thing that is true, then it is false to say there is no truth. And what is being dismantled is the acknowledgement that there is any objective reality outside of what I want to believe, to prefer, my opinion, my choice. And this idealized sense of liberty divested of any notion of objective truth becomes the absolute supreme value and all moral laws become sub subjectivistic. And to, and to suggest otherwise is to be sus suspect of being a part of an oppressive system of belief or on a power trip. So, here's the choice before us. Fantasy or reality? <laughs> Delusion or the light of truth? And of course, to somebody who doesn't agree with that, that sounds utterly arrogant. Total bigotry. Part of the problem. Jordan Peterson points out, there's a lot more pathways to hell than there are pathways to heaven. That's what our Lord said, didn't he? The road to heaven is a narrow road. It's not this wide, broad way that anybody and everybody will find their path, their place, and be included, and, and, and we're all able to just do what we want and be sincere, good, nice people. It's not as simplistic as that perception. But Jordan Peterson was able to see deeper than the surface, and he points out, quote, we better get our act together and start building our ark. So what is this ark we need to build? How do we take care of our souls? First, I want to begin by quoting a prophecy, one of the most important and powerful prophecies of Cardinal Ratzinger before he was elected Pope Benedict XVI. He was interviewed in this book called Faith in the Future. And this was, I think, in 1972. And it's a long quote, but I'm going to just take a small part. From the crisis of today, the church of tomorrow will emerge. A church that will find her essence afresh, with full conviction in that which was always at her center. Faith in the triune God, in Jesus Christ, the Son of God made man, in the presence of the Spirit until the end of the world. In faith and prayer, she will again recognize her true center and experience the sacraments again as the worship of God. So when talking about caring for our souls, how do we know our true center? The core of our identity, our anchor of hope and faith, the ground which we stand on as being an objective ground of truth, holy ground, solid ground. How do we find that? How do we cultivate it? First, be rooted in the Lord's Word. Faith in the triune God, as Cardinal Ratzinger said, in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the presence of the Spirit of promise until the end of the world. Because it's the truth that is our greatest weapon. Because the enemy's most effective weapon is the lie. And we see that how he, how he twists language, how he twists narratives, 
how we twist perception of God, the church, Christ, morals. He twists it by messing in a serpentine way, subtle way, with half-truths. And we see those tactics when we see the serpent in the garden at the fall of Genesis chapter 3. Without going into that, the second thing about our true center of our identity, the church's sacraments, especially reconciliation and Eucharist. This is what most keeps us anchored in our baptismal identity in Christ. And the third, cultivating a longing for union with God through living faith and prayer in the hope of eternal life with Him. We have to be very clear in our own consciousness that this world is passing away. And over my dead body, will we allow anything to separate us from the love of Christ? That means whatever sacrifices have to happen, if it means being separated from the love of Christ, then I'm going to embrace the cross. We have to have a clear consciousness as Christians that we're not made for this world. We're not of this world. This world is passing away, and it's a, a pilgrimage preparation for eternity. We have to be clear on this, because we've been, we've been experiencing a wishy-washy Christianity for the past 50 years that makes it seem like everything is all about this life, and it's not. This life is more is important. It's meaningful. It's beautiful. But it's not everything. It's just the beginning. We need to prepare ourselves for the condition of struggle. As Peter Kreeft says, we have to have a kind of optimism and pessimism. And this is what he means. The pessimism of realizing that you're in a decaying and decadent culture. And you're going to be increasingly called upon to make heroic sacrifices. And optimism to know that he is stronger and he will win in the end and we are on the winning side. And Peter Kreef says this, we are hobbits and we are facing orcs. But God has given us the whole story including the future. And if you look at the book of Revelation as future history, you see two things. On one hand, there is horrific stuff in the future. But on the other hand, it's a fixed fight. The Lamb wins. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let us face the reality of our lives with the certainty that all reality and all of our lives belong to Him. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future, and He's holding us. In Jesus' name. And we have to be certain that the Lord is not simply on the sidelines watching all this happen. He is solicitous, deeply concerned about our salvation, and He is at work to save us in our present times. Jesus and Mary have manifest deep sadness at the state of our race, and they're giving us instruments and tools to be able to be more than conquerors in Him who has won the victory for us. And one of these weapons is the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And that's what I want to touch on. We're living in an era of mercy, a designated time, in preparation for the second coming of Christ. God our Father, the worker of wonders and author of miracles, who at Mary's conception created her immaculately full of grace, has chosen her to prepare the way for a new, abundant outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Mary is aware of the spiritual war raging behind the scenes, which goes to the heart of human events and play their part in the unfolding of history. We see this in La, La Salette, Akita, Our Lady of Good Success before that, and most recently to Elizabeth Kindleman, in which Mary says, we're now entering the final battle against Satan. Mary the Immaculate is the new weave, prophetically, predestined in Genesis 3.15 as the greatest herald of the gospel's promise of victory over evil. Mary Immaculate is the woman clothed with the sun, the ark of the new covenant, who is seen in the book of Apocalypse with Saint Michael the archangel at war against the dragon. 
As the woman clothed with the Son of God's robe of salvation, wrapped in the mantle of his justice, assumed into heaven as the first fruits of resurrection, for all eternity she shares the victory of Christ. And as the radiant dawn preparing the way for the fullness of time, the universal restoration of all things in Christ. Our Blessed Mother is the Son of Justice, excuse me, the Immaculate Radiant Dawn announcing the rising of the Son of Justice that we may always live in the light of His coming. And it's through the merits of Jesus' mercy on the cross that she has been commissioned to enkindle the saving fire of God's love in our hearts in preparation for his final victory over the powers of darkness at work in the world today. She was at the heart of God's plan for the fullness of time at Jesus' first coming is also to play a pivotal role at the end of time to prepare the way for Jesus' second coming. Our Lord zealously desires to come to us in the power of his final victory, the glory of the radiant dawn of his second coming, and to do so through the flame of love of his mother's most pure heart. As, as Jordan Peterson said, we've got to get our act together and start to build our ark. And Jesus said in these messages to Elizabeth Kindleman that the ark for our times is her heart, just as Noah's ark was for his times. Jesus is calling us to get on board. Mary says, I assure you, my little one, that I have never before given into your hands such a powerful force of grace. Ever since the Word became flesh, I have not undertaken a greater movement until now that could blind Satan as much. My love that is spreading will overcome the satanic hatred that contaminates the world so that the greatest number of souls is saved from damnation. I'm confirming there has never been anything like this before. This is the greatest miracle ever I am accomplishing for all. We will put out fire with fire. We will put out the fire of hatred with the fire of love. Jesus spoke at length to Elizabeth Kindleman about the time of grace and the spirit of love quite comparable to the first Pentecost, flooding the earth with its power. That will be the great miracle drawing the attention of all humanity. All that is the effusion of the effect of grace of the Blessed Virgin's flame of love. The earth has been covered in darkness, says the Lord, because of the lack of faith in the soul of humanity, and therefore will experience a great jolt Following that, people will believe this jolt by the power of faith will create a new world through the flame of love of the Blessed Virgin. Faith will take root in souls. Our Blessed Mother and our Lord implores us to pray, to make sacrifice, to fast, to keep vigil in order to help them in this fight against evil. Our response makes a difference. Our instruments to bring about this powerful work is the same as always been in Fatima, before and after, prayer and sacrifice. Jesus says to Elizabeth and to us, by your sufferings, you have become a victim burning with love in whom the Most Holy Trinity takes delight. Do not fear that anything will separate you from us. Even for an instant, heaven is open for you. Is there any greater reward for you than to rest in the arms of the Heavenly Father and be filled with the Most Holy Trinity? Your burning sacrifice of love will lead souls to the knowledge of and love of God. This is my delight. That is why I keep you on earth, so you can be a burning victim of love. With my divine eyes, I look upon you with favor. To wrap up this segment of the flame of love, our Blessed Mother inspires in us undeterred determination. And I'm telling you, I, and I encourage you to check it out. P get yourself a copy of the abbreviated diary. Start reading the messages and let our Blessed Mother prove to you the authenticity of what they're communicating. Invite her to kindle in your heart the flame of love that sanctifies, that brings us deeper into the life of Christ 
with greater fervor and zeal, as we saw in the prophet Elijah, calling us to true worship of God. Our Blessed Mother says, enter into battle. We will be the conquerors. Let those souls whom I have chosen do everything to prepare for the great mission ahead. I will support you with miracles as never seen before. And St. Padre Pio says, we must have boundless faith in the divine goodness, for the victory is absolutely certain. And his victory is at the core of our identity and what it means to be a Catholic Christian, what it means to be in Christ. In order to give credible witness to this, we have to experience the reality of it, not just in words, but in our hearts. And the flame of love can bring that about. It can kindle that in you, as it has kindled it in me. I want to conclude with the following. Pope Emeritus, Benedict XVI, while he was Pope Emeritus specifically, said this, Dear friends, may no adversity paralyze you. Be afraid neither of the world nor of the future, nor of your weaknesses. The Lord has allowed you to live in this moment of history so that by your faith his name will continue to resound throughout the world. Because God became man, he can now forever make his own the deepest wounds of our humanity and thus can give us the grace to receive healing from the one who is a divine physician and a master of transforming messes into masterpieces and trials into triumphs. Let us face the reality of our lives with the certainty that all reality and all of our lives belong to God. We belong to Him, and He belongs to us more intimately than two spouses do to each other. This is what it means to profess the Lord Jesus' resurrection. It means we believe and we are convinced that He is alive and living in our midst to the end. He will never abandon us. And because he lives, there's no doubt that goodness, truth, and the beauty of his light and love will have the victory in our lives. That all of our struggles will prove worthwhile. And he, he who spoke the first word will definitely have the last word. And if his word is in us, then greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world.